So thank you all for uh, joining uh, this evening for this, uh, which is our fifth session in the professionalism series. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on uh, two uh, professions, uh, engineering and architecture. Um, for those of you who attended the earlier sessions, you'll see that uh, we focused on different groups of uh, professions in each one of the series. If you missed any of those, they're all available on the uh, SP uh, YouTube channel. So this evening, we have three speakers who are going to uh, discuss different aspects of uh, two professions, which are regulated professions in Quebec and in the rest of Canada and most, most of the world. Uh, specifically engineering and architecture. So we have three uh, expert uh, participants who are going to discuss some of the ethical issues that they face in the practice of, of this profession. So um, the first speaker, I'll introduce them in the order of appearance. The first speaker is Ronnie Guerre. Uh, the second one is Sean Corinne. And the third speaker, uh, even though he's in third place, he's not lesser person because of that, is Avi Friedman. Uh, Ronnie Gare uh, is a colleague of ours. Uh, he uh, is very much involved in uh, the community through uh, the Chavrashas congregation and through the Spanish and Portuguese congregation where he sits on the board. And... Um, he hails from South Africa originally, as you can tell from his accent. So uh, oh. he actually uh, grew up in Johannesburg, South Africa, and did his uh, first degree in engineering at Witzwatersland. Uh, I hope I pronounced that one correctly. In, in South Africa, and he then uh, moved later to Canada where he completed a master's and a PhD in engineering at uh, the University of Toronto. His uh, specialty, if you will, is uh, environmental engineering, and he is most interested in uh, issues related to the ability of uh, organizations to uh, disinfect drinking water so that it's safe to drink and to uh, disinfect uh, wastewater, uh, which most people refer to as sewage. So uh, it's very much of a, a focused uh, activity uh, as far as he's concerned from that point of view. And uh, he has been uh, a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at McGill ever since 1980. Uh, and in addition to that, and this uh, uh, overlaps very well with our professionalism series, he gives uh, the course in professional ethics in the Faculty of Engineering. So uh, he certainly uh, has a, a very good understanding of some of the issues that are of concern to us from an ethical perspective. And uh, as far as his involvement in the Spanish, he's, uh, he sits on the board and he's also the uh, chair of our education committee. Our next speaker is Sean Corinne, uh, whom I've known for 30 some years, ever since he was a young man. And I've watched him grow and develop throughout his career into the uh, uh, professional, which he is today. Uh, he did his first degree in engineering as well at, the, at Concordia University here in Montreal. And he followed up uh, after his engineering degree with an MBA and uh, is a uh, member of uh, a professional uh, organization called the PMP, uh, where he uh, is certified uh, in, in that particular area of practice. He currently works for Delmar International and uh, is the continuous improvement manager. I hope that that means that he continuously improves himself as well, because as we've seen before in some of our other sessions, 
uh, one of the obligations of professional is uh, compulsory uh, continuing education. And so uh, he fits that, that uh, model perfectly. So uh, he's particularly interested in logistics and the technical aspect of logistics. And uh, in terms of his community involvement, ever since he's been a young man, he's been involved in, in different uh, community activities in particular with uh, the Birthright Israel trips. I believe he's participated in 18 of those. And uh, he currently is a VP at the Spanish and volunteers for many different types of activities. And he's also an expectant father. Uh, so uh, we wish him well in that. That's a new engineering feat that he will have to uh, <laughs> take care of later. That's uh, a big one. <laughs> And our third, but it's an enjoyable one. And our third speaker is uh, our colleague uh, from McGill University, Avi Friedman. And I must say that uh, the link that I have with Avi is that uh, Avi started out uh, his career uh, as an architect in Milan. And I'm going to uh, do my sunset part of my career in Italy as well at the University of Torino. So our, our two lives sort of intersect from that point of view. And Abby goes back and forth to Italy from time to time as well as a lecturer. And uh, I do the same thing. So we went after studying at Politecnico in Milano, he went on to uh, do a degree in architecture at Technion and uh, then a master's in architecture at McGill. And he followed up with a PhD uh, in architecture at our sister university across the mountain, the University of Montreal. Uh, his major concern uh, in life, uh, in professional life at least, uh, is the issue of housing. And I must say, uh, this struck me uh, because uh, in uh, a, a recent novel published by uh, a well-known Israeli novelist by the name of Aaron Appelfeld uh, in his book, uh, which is called uh, Aviv et Mori. Uh, no, no, it's Aviv et Mori, but it's Aviv et Imi. Uh, he uh, talks about uh, the importance of houses in memory. And as, uh, Feld, as Applefeld points out in his novel, our memory is always constructed around a house. A house being a home, a place where we live, a place where we construct our lives. And so I thought it was quite interesting to see that link uh, between the novelist and the, and the architect. At any rate, uh, Avi's uh, concern has been in sustainable uh, housing and, and living and making sure that to people have access to the proper types of, of housing, uh, et cetera. He is a member of the Order of Architects in Quebec and has won a number uh, of awards, including the UN uh, World Habitat uh, Award. So he's certainly uh, very well versed in the, in the issues of concern to us uh, today and uh, particularly aware of of many of the ethical issues which affect uh, housing and community. So uh, we look forward to hearing what Avi has to share with us later on. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Ronnie Guerre to uh, take the floor and to make his presentation. I just remind everyone that you have 20 minutes and I will be uh, impitoyable and remind you of your time uh, as it, as it uh, evolves. So Ronnie, you're on. Thank you, thank you very much, Jim. Um, I'm going to share my screen immediately with you and get started. Can you, um, can you see my, my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> um, so I'll just go over a quick outline of what I'm gonna be speaking about. Um, civil engineering, what is civil engineering, uh, the code of ethics, um, and finally the intersection of halacha, minhag, and other aspects of Jewish life with my profession. Um, 
Okay. Uh, can you still see the screen? Yes. Okay, good. Um, finally, there'll be case studies and a take home message or a couple of take home messages. All right. So, so I thought I should give a, a quick background about civil engineering because I think some people are not aware of exactly what civil engineering entails or what civil engineers do. So civil engineering deals with anything to do with civic society um, in contrast to military engineering. And historically, there were really only two branches of engineering. There was civ uh, civil and military. And then all the others are subsequent um, creations depending on the needs of society. So our mission, very briefly, as, as Hillel would have said, standing on one leg, is to serve the public safely. That's, that's essentially our mission. And that means that we don't, uh, our culture, so to speak, our civil engineering culture is not to create products that are going to be sold to society. And we don't have this uh, need to take sides, to, to, uh, to try to push a particular solution to a problem. We just make, want to make sure that it's in the best interests of the public and the, sa and the safest. Um, very quickly, I'll go through the, the sub-disciplines of uh, the, the, the main sub-disciplines of civil engineering. So we have um, structural engineering. And here's an example of a, a, a very fancy futuristic type of building in Dubai. Then there's geotechnical engineering which involves foundations um, mainly, and also anything that supports soils, such as, the, such, as, such as earth dams. Now, here's an example of um, a foundation problem. Um, you all know, you're all aware of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but you might think it, well, it's a structural problem because it's leaning, but actually the structure is in perfectly good shape. So it's not really a, structural problem it's a foundation problem the next area is environmental engineering and i'll just give a quick plug for a textbook that um, maybe you'd like to go to your nearest bookshop or amazon and buy quickly but you can see that uh, we deal with water and wastewater treatment or water and wastewater purification um, we also deal with large uh, very large systems such as this one here in toronto which is the one of the wastewater treatment plants in Toronto. Next subdivision is water resources and hydraulics. Uh, deal, uh, deals with controlling floods and also uh, hydropower, such as this, this fine example in, in, in northern Quebec. <clears throat> and finally, there's transportation. So this is anything dealing with runways, uh, trains, cars, and so on. Um, so I don't need to explain that further. Okay, so this is civil engineering. Now, what about engineering in general? What is different with engineering compared to other professions? Um, some of these differences may be obvious, but others are not. But let's start at the beginning. So only a person or even an engineer who's registered on the role of the Professional Association of the Province can use the designation inch or p inch, depending on the language. So they, that means they are licensed to practice engineering. So this is similar in a way to a, a medical doctor, MD. You can't be an MD unless you are on the roll. Um, a lot of people are aware of the iron ring. I have an iron ring myself, and almost all Canadian engineers have an iron ring. But this is not a professional designation. It's, it's, a, it's a symbol and it's a very nice symbol, but it's not a professional designation. It's not the equivalent of a professional engineer. So to get the license, you need a minimum of two years of practical experience. So I guess that's equivalent to the residencies for the, for the doctors. But what's interesting is the second bullet uh, and the second part of that second bullet, which is communication. So engineers have to be proficient in communication because the civil engineers in particular, because they have to communicate their ideas to the general public. <clears throat> and then there are all, there are, there are as, I, as shown here, six different competencies. And as Jim mentioned earlier in the introduction, 
continuing education is part of the competency. And finally, in Quebec, uh, engineers have to be registered. In Quebec, you have to pass a French language exam. Now, what was I surprised to discover when I first studied the code of ethics? First of all, that engineering can involve life and death situations. Now, you, you, you may think, okay, somebody that's designing an airplane, mechanical engineer, clearly a life and death situation. But even environmental engineers, if we don't use the right disinfectant and the right concentration, then you know, people can, can die. And I'll, I'll give you a case study of this at the end of, of my talk. Um, another interesting point is that uh, many people think that, and, and in fact can do, engineering type work. For instance, you can fix up the plumbing in your house. However, and, and you can install a, a simple water, water purification system uh, in your cottage. However, if the cost exceeds a thousand dollars and that's not not a lot of money then you really sh should be employing or should be engaging hiring a professional engineer and then if you're doing foundations formwork framework electrical etc similar idea but about a hundred thousand dollars on the other hand engineers are sometimes obliged to engage the assistance of other professions for example for a new building a large building and it, it, it specified making measurements, layouts, preparation, report, etc. We have to hire someone like Avi Friedman, who is an architect. And that's a requirement. It's part of the code. Another thing is the, the fine. <laughs> if you claim to be an engineer and you put inch after your name and you're not really an engineer, you can be fined not less than 2,500 and on more than 62,500 in the case of a natural person or 5,000 or 125,000 in other cases. Now, this is very strange. You know, what is, what is a natural person? Well, it turns out that a natural person is an individual. So an individual like myself, if I'm just working on my own, I can be fined minimum 2,500. But if it's a company, a corporation, and they claim that they have engineers working on a project, they can be fined a much larger amount. Um, <clears throat> another, th another interesting thing is that an engineer has a duty to report to the OIQ in this case in Quebec, the Order of Engineers of Quebec. You have a duty to report if, the, if, if he or she feels that a certain work is a danger to the public, to the, sorry, is a danger to public safety. You must notify the OIQ, not just, not just the boss, unless you are absolutely sure that your boss is going to inform the OIQ. So this duty to, to report is, I was, not, I, was, I was not aware of that until I really started to study this code of ethics. Another, another um, situation is the following, um, that you may not cease to act for the account of a client. In other words, you may not just decide not to work for a client once you've been hired, unless you have just and reasonable grounds for doing that. Um, and those grounds are, if you find yourself in a conflict of interest, then immediately you can, you can rescind, you can, you can uh, recuse yourself, or you can say, sorry, I cannot continue this work. Or if your, your client asks you to do illegal work or unfair or fraudulent acts. And the last point is really interesting. If you, as an engineer, give your client a certain advice and the client says, no, our marketing department feels that that's not necessary, we're going to go ahead anyway, then you can stop work immediately. What about the intersection of halacha or minhag or other aspects of Jewish life with my own profession? Well, let's see. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list some quotes from the Chumash and I'm not going to read them out word for word. But I'll just mention them. So in the second paragraph of the Shema, it really, to me, it talks about environmental engineering and that if you don't be careful, you're not going to have rain. And this is, we see this in the whole world now. If we're not careful with the environment, we start to have climate change and um, all, 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 the, all the ills that um, affect us 
with respect to climate change. Another section is when you besiege a city, you, you, you may not destroy uh, fruit trees. So only trees that you know are not trees for food, those you may destroy and, and cut down. So again, it's responsibility of the environment. And by the way, all of these are in, uh, in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, and we're, we're busy reading these chapters right now, these, these, these weeks in uh, every Shabbat and Monday and, and uh, Thursday in, this, in the synagogue. When you build a new house, you have to make a parapet for your roof so that you, so that someone doesn't fall off. Okay, so again, it's well known. And finally, um, this is a, this this I like this one that um, soldiers when they leave a camp they have to take a spade with them, and when they need to relieve themselves, they need to cover it up <laughs> so that you don't have um, smells and you don't have uh, unhealthy conditions. How has being Jewish affected the practice of my profession? In, in, in this case, I'm a professor, a teacher. Have there been any conflicts between my professional activities and my Jewish ideals? Well, I wear a kippah. Fortunately, there's, been nev there's never been a problem with that, with my students, with my colleagues. Very, I'm very, I must admit, I'm, I, I feel very, very fortunate about that. Um, at McGill, classes, um, there, there, there's a calendar of Jewish holidays and classes, um, need not be held on Jewish holidays, provided I can make alternative arrangements. Um, <clears throat> and then the ethics content in teaching, several of these ideas that I've mentioned already today, I've been able to incorporate into my, into my teaching. And finally, in Barbados, there's a campus, believe it or not, there's a McGill campus in Barbados. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was interesting trying to be Jewish in Barbados, but there, there is kosher food available in the supermarkets, and uh, there are Jews living in Barbados. There's a couple of synagogues, actually. So it's, it's possible to function as a, uh, you know, as a, as, as a, as a Sabbath-observing Jew, even in Barbados. Um, all right, so the last thing that I'd like to cover is a case study. Um, this is a very famous case study, but it happened 21 years ago, so maybe some people have forgotten about it or are not even aware. There's a little town called Walkerton, uh, which is northwest uh, of uh, Toronto. And in the year 2000, in May, there was a lot of rain, an uh, un un unusually large amount of rain, especially on the 12th of May. So the purple, the purple bars show the, that daily rainfall, and the blue line shows the cumulative rainfall over that period and it, and you can see on the bottom left that this was a 60-year return period so only once every 60 years did this sort of rainfall occur so there was a farm owned by dr Biesenthal, and um i'd like you to focus on lot 20 so this is a strip of land and a well for drinking water which is well number five so what actually happened in May of 2020? Well, there were heavy rains, as I showed in the previous uh, two previous slides ago. On April 20th, fresh manure was spread on lot 20, which is less than 81 meters from well number five. So that's fine. The doctor is certainly allowed to put man manure on his land. Um, the problem was, that well number five was operating without chlorine and the operators didn't check on the chlorine level may 15th they sent water samples to the laboratory this was a routine probably they had to send samples on the 15th and the 31st or the 30th of every month the lab <coughs> uh, sent the results back to the operator and this is very important they just sent it to the operator two days later, saying that there were very high coliform levels. The next day, two children had bloody diarrhea or reported with bloody diarrhea, diarrhea to the local hospital. May 19th, the health unit again contact, contacted the operator. And the operator assured them that the water was fine. And by the way, the operator had almost no training in microbiology 
or in, in, the, in the health impacts of fecal coliforms or E. coli. This is the worst. The worst is on May 22nd, the operator altered daily operating sheets to conceal no chlorine. So seven people died, a thousand were infected, and many with permanent damage. So the main conclusions were, although there were several wells, only the fifth, only well number five was in use. The operators had no training, were not aware that eleva elevated microbe levels can cause disease. They falsified records for 20 years and the well was too shallow. So if it would have drawn water from deeper down, it would not have been affected by the manure that was spread. The Ministry of the Environment Inspections Program was not effective and they communicated with the operator, not directly with the regional health authority. So the take home message or messages, first of all, a professional in the legal sense must be a paid up member of a professional order. Second, the mission of civil engineers is to serve the public safely. Three, there are, there are penalties for masquerading as a professional and or for not upholding the professional code. In our current environment, we can still hold up one's head high as a Jew and be respected for it. And when circumstances warrant it, use a professional. Thanks for listening, and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Uh, focused specifically on the issues that are of concern to us, and I appreciate that. Uh, when we come to the uh, question period at the end, after our other two speakers have uh, had a chance to present uh, their work, there will be a question and answer period. And uh, following that, uh, Rabbi White uh, will uh, weigh in on some of the halakhic issues uh, some of which you have raised already in your presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, we move on now to uh, another engineer, Mr. Corinne. So thank you very much for the great intro, Jim. Um, so yes, my name is Sean Corin. I'm going to be speaking a bit about what I do um, as a uh, uh, as uh, as an employee at Del Mar International. Um, Basically, I serve as the manager of continuous improvement and digital engagement at Delmar. And uh, over the course of the presentation, I'm going to go through an introduction to software engineering and explain a little bit about digital transformation. I'll discuss digital experiences. I'll also explain what continuous improvement is all about. I'll touch on the code of ethics for software engineers, and I'll bring up a scenario that I've encountered around software and Judaism. It's a scenario that I try to make as relatable as possible to um, everybody in the audience. And finally, I'll discuss some Jewish ideals as they pertain to what I do. So first off, let's talk about software engineering and digital transformation. Everybody's heard the buzzwords around digital, around technology, around software kind of taking over. But what's, what's the point of it all? Where does it all come from? Well, in reality, business can speak a very different language than technology. And oftentimes, the people who are making business decisions are doing so in a world that's very different from what is possible technologically. And at the very least, it could be very difficult, very cumbersome, and very expensive to build out the technology that individuals on the business side of things are thinking of. So it's the role of a software engineer to translate those business requirements into what is possible, what is feasible, and come up with a good and solid plan to make that come to fruition. Um, as Ronnie mentioned, it's very possible that somebody in the marketing team will come up and say, hey, let's do all of these amazing things. And in reality, that would either not be feasible, it would be dangerous, or it would just be way too expensive. So the main point is to really define a solid process and a workflow to work harmoniously with the business while leveraging technology to make that all happen and work well together. So in, in this day and age, especially with COVID, we're all leveraging technology to make our lives have some semblance of normality. 
So we've all really, everybody here today has already embraced digital. We're all on Zoom. We're all speaking virtually to one another. And you know what? We're very lucky that we've been able to do it because even 50 years ago, this would have been impossible. So we are very lucky. But on the global scale, if we look at organizations and companies, my own included, technology globalization give us the ability to be more agile as a company and have very dynamic work environments. So just in the past 10 years, I mean, we're collaborating with, uh, we have offices all over the world throughout Southeast Asia and Europe. And the fact that we're all able to work together makes for such a seamless functionality that otherwise wouldn't have been possible. So that's the digital portion of it, basically translating business requirements and business needs into a system people can use regardless of where they are in the world and building the system in such a way that it'll actually work well with the current workflows that are in place and also have some safeguards in place so well as Ronnie said we can't uh, make any big dire mistakes. Um, Delmar is a shipping organization uh, we're a freight forwarder we're a customs broker um, we have air, ocean, and ground transportation, as well as direct consulting services. So basically, if you have a company that wants to move something from one space in the world to another, we can help with everything that it entails. And with that comes a certain level of liability as well. If we make a mistake, it's very possible that something doesn't end up in the place that it should. I don't know if uh, some of you have heard of the evergreen ship that got stuck recently in the Suez Canal. That was an example of, I guess, something or some, I guess, relevant portion of our industry that went a little bit wrong through poor planning. Um, I also want to touch on continuous improvement. And what it comes down to is not settling for the status quo. So in an organization, we need to constantly analyze, improve, and grow, and then repeat. So... Um, obviously, that's something that we do want to do as individuals as well. But within an organization, especially one that grows, and Delmar, thankfully, has grown significantly in the past couple of years, largely due to acquisition, it's very important that we do that analysis, that improvement, and that growth. And you know, also, there's, uh, there's something going on in the world when it comes to digital. We've all heard of companies like Uber, the world's biggest taxi company that doesn't own a single car. We've all heard of Airbnb, the world's biggest hotel chain doesn't own a single hotel. So part of what we do is also keeping our ear to the ground to understand emerging technologies in the marketplace and seeing what we could potentially leverage, what we could take advantage of. Um, and I'll touch a little bit more on that for, uh, a little bit later in the presentation. And finally, discussing digital transformation and experiences. Basically, not only making something functional, but making it beautiful and easy to use. Think of your iPhone. It's not only functional, it's easy and it's beautiful. So that's all part of it. So basically, the mission statement that we have is to create a modular, unified, and functional digital solution to allow any stakeholder to engage quickly and easily with our company through any channel they desire. Now, this experience has to be surgically tailored by stakeholder type, region, and be fully open to expansion, improvement, and growth. So that pretty much sums up what I do. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, this uh, just basically shows what we need to do when it comes to software and when it comes to building out software. So in terms of the code of ethics for software engineers, the main, the main mission is to protect the public. Now, specifically with software, many people do not understand the nuances of software. I'm sure all of you have seen emails come in with somebody telling you that if you don't forward this email off to a thousand people that you're going to get a virus that's going to plague your computer, or you've all received emails saying that uh, you've won a couple of million dollars if you just send a couple of thousand dollars over their way. Um, so these are crude attempts at social engineering, leveraging software. But we've also seen, especially recently, a lot of malware attacks, a lot of hacking attacks, a lot of security breaches. And these have come to the largest companies, the most stable companies that you've ever seen. So it's very important for a software engineer to test. In fact, we're responsible 
to test and ensure that there are, um, you can't say no vulnerabilities, but as few as possible. And I, I do want to highlight that that responsibility also comes towards social engineering. So we actually run tests wherein we send some of these phishing attacks to our employees to see if we are at risk of them. And if we are, we run additional education campaigns to ensure that it does not happen again. So in contrast to other realms of engineering, like mechanical engineering or civil engineering, if there is a problem with a bridge, well, yes, it's possible that the bridge could fall down or cause problems or have to be reworked every 10 years as we see often in Quebec. Um, when you think of a computer program, you don't necessarily think that there's the same level of risk. But in reality, especially considering how the world runs today, it is power plants, electric networks, transportation grids all run on software. So it's very, very important to test and ensure that it's all running correctly. I also wanna to briefly touch on coding versus engineering because they are two very different things. Coding uh, basically is building out the program building out whatever platform, whatever stack that you're dealing with. Whereas engineering actually encompasses the entire journey of the build from start to finish. The first step is understanding what the business requirements are. The second step is building out a plan to ensure that it can be done and it will be done properly. The third is planning out the project. And the fourth and final is the most exciting, and it's the one I love the most, is actually executing it. So building it out from start to finish. Bringing it back to Judaism, um, it's, it, it's interesting because when, whenever we think of, of Israel, the first thing that comes to mind is high tech and startup nation and uh, ways and all of these really amazing technologies that have emerged out of Israel. And you know what? It, it's true. It's absolutely incredible to see the technology that comes out of Israel. And these are the only, these are only the ones you hear about. I mean, it, over the course of uh, over the course of my employment uh, at Delmar, we've partnered up and and done business with a multitude of Israeli companies um, who, who really have contributed so much to the ecosystem, both on the front end. So the front end are things that you are able to see yourself, as well as on the back end. Think of the microchips that power your computer or your phone, or the technology that powers Google Maps. It's absolutely incredible. And uh, if for any of you who haven't read the book, Startup Nation, I highly recommend it because it really does detail why Israelis are so good at innovating. It's that tachlis, the, um, the drive to succeed that just comes from an attitude where bureaucracy does not exist and anything is possible. So that's, that's really where I see a lot of affinity between my Judaism, and I guess Judaism isn't necessarily the same as, as Israel, but as, uh, as Jim mentioned, I did uh, staff many birthright trips. I was very fortunate that my parents uh, led me to a, a very large affinity to the country. So I really, I, I do have that connection and, uh, and, and there's something there when it comes to software. Um, but also what I do um, in terms of building out software, building out an experience um, and innovation and continuous improvement have a lot to do with Jewish values. Um, Jewish values that consist of education, innovation and, and, and sharing really, because when you build something out from a software perspective, you are able to share it with many people quite easily. Um, so that's where I really do see that affinity with Jewish values. Um, I do want to touch on a case study, and I, I struggled with it a little bit, just because Judaism specifically doesn't touch what I do um, all, all the time. Uh, the company I work at is, is a Jewish-owned company, and it's very nice because there are some, there are some things that... Uh, that you can discuss and have that connection with different individuals because it's uh, because it's owned primarily by uh, Jewish people. Um, but one thing that I did want to touch is that, as we all know, technology is on twenty four seven. So a website is constantly operating. You can go to Google anytime, and it's operating. So 
my question was really around should websites of non-essential Jewish businesses think of, I don't know, a Jewish owned uh, sales company or an online store, should they be closed to transactions on Shabbat and on high holidays? And I found this to be really interesting. It's not, it's not something that I personally grappled with, but I've seen a few websites that actually close to transactions on Shabbat. Um, and, and this is something that I really wanted to consider, and I actually wanted to hear some opinions on it, because on one hand, you do have the website, it's operating, it's on its own, nobody really has to do anything. It'll run on its own, and it's there. One can argue that the actual financial transaction could be settled after Shabbat, could be settled once uh, Shabbat is finished. Um, so yes, the transaction will go through and there'll be the confirmation number, but the money will change hands, let's say between the credit card company and the merchant outside of Shabbat and outside of the high holidays. Um, so for example, this is something that uh, we've looked at when we're building out the Spanish and Portuguese website, which was changed a couple of years ago. Should we accept payments for donations if somebody wants to give it over Shabbat or over a high holiday? Um, so I thought that this was very interesting, and maybe we can open up the forum a little bit after to discuss this, because I would actually want to hear um, what Halacha would say on it, because it, it's very, very interesting, and I, I've looked at the literature, and there's not much guidance around this. Um, so yeah, again, just to reiterate, technology functions 24-7. I mean, it's automated. It works. There's a little computer in some server farm somewhere in the world, and it's running the code. So. Should that be close to transactions explicitly over Shabbat and high holidays? The final thing that I do want to discuss is Jewish ideals. Um, so this has actually uh, affected me personally in, uh, in my employment. And that's the one of giving back to the community. So I, I don't want to uh, specifically highlight my company. I'm not vouching for it in any way, but I am very proud to work for a company that gives back to the community. Um, and not only to Jewish organizations, but to the community as a whole, and definitely Jewish organizations as well. It's something that I can be proud of. And whenever I see the Del Mar logo on a, on a sponsorship or on any Jewish, um, on any Jewish forum, I, I, I'm very proud of that. Um, but also a company should, in my, in my view, and in terms of the Jewish ideals, take care of its people, take care of its employees. So technology is the vehicle but it's not the company, it's the people that drive a company. And it's very important to have created that culture of giving back to your community and helping out. That's how I was brought up. And I'm very happy that I work for an organization that shares those ideals. Because at the end of the day, it's critically important to be proud of what you do and the company you do it for. Because you know, work, work takes up a good amount of time. We're talking, you know, 40, 50 hours a week. And if you're not enjoying what you do, if you're not proud of what you do, then you, know, there, you, might, you might want to look for, for something different. And finally, what I get from my Jewish ideals, and I try and bring that to work every day, is to constantly improve, innovate, and grow. Because without that, you're staying stagnant. And it's, it's so important to just try and do new things and see how you can make things better. So I guess with that, I want to thank all of you for taking the time. And I guess we'll open up the floor to questions a little bit later on. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, and as you know, uh, at the end of the uh, session, uh, Rabbi White uh, will be joining us. And I don't know if you asked for a psagdin, but uh, maybe he'll be able to discuss uh, Misachet Shabbat uh, with you afterward and discuss uh, some of these issues that you brought up. Uh, we're moving on, however, uh, quickly to our third speaker, Avi Friedman. And uh, it's particularly interesting to have Avi participate in this uh, exchange uh, because uh, whether we're talking about engineers or we're talking about architects, we're talking about people who are very much involved in what we call the built environment. And the built environment can be physical or it can be virtual. Uh, and we've touched on both sides of these issues. 
So um, without further ado, I uh, give the floor to Avi. Thank you very much. I, I don't have a presentation, uh, so. Your you presence have... is sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I did not, I did not know that this is part of the, uh, that I could have included presentation, but I will try to animate it to the best I can. Uh, as uh, James mentioned before, uh, I was born in Israel. I'm Israeli, you can tell by my accent. Um, and in fact, uh, my parents uh, arrived to Israel from Europe and I studied in Israel electrical engineering, electrical, uh, the electrical profession in high school. It's something that is not very much available here. It's a vocation. And I really found out that I love to build things, to work with my end. And after my military service, I decided to study architecture, architecture. And I started my, as James mentioned before, I started my architecture studies at Milan, returned to Israel and completed my studies at the Faculty of Architecture at the Technion. Um, on my, uh, upon my graduation, I realized that I really like very much uh, to stay in the academic environment. And this took me to Montreal, to McGill University, and uh, later to University of Montreal, as was mentioned earlier. And um, when I finished my studies, my studies at uh, University of Montreal, McGill was looking for someone to lead a program in affordable housing. And this was very attractive. It's something that I really enjoyed very much. And I co-founded with a colleague, the Affordable Homes Program at McGill University. In parallel, parallel to that, I uh, joined the Order of Architects of Quebec. I established a consultancy firm and um, I'm, I'm practicing architects doing various job primarily to the private and some to the private, but most of my clients are large public sector that I consult uh, regularly. I'm practicing, I'm doing many residential projects and I also work on urban renewal uh, and preparing master planning for large cities, for cities. Um, it is a small but active practice and I really enjoy it enjoying very much the balance between being at the university and at the same time being able to be aware of what's going on in the real world. Now, um, with regard to code of ethics, um, I think that what Ronnie mentioned is more or less what happened in my own profession, in, in the profession of architecture. But the most important thing to bear in, one, in mind when one is trained to be an architect, that you do not end your relationship with the project when you hand your drawings. In fact, once you build something, your obligation only begin and you are responsible to the building life uh, throughout for sure for the first five years along with the developer, but in fact, for the rest of your professional life, you are responsible to the well-being of that building. It needs to stand and needs to be right. And you are also obliged to uh, maintain and keep record of all that you do. But uh, uh, I believe that there are many other things that are important to know. And this is a uh, collaboration with others. And this is uh, the fact that you must support or provide information for a colleague. If a colleague calls you and say, look, can you tell me how to do something? 
or how did you do certain things, it is an obligation by a code that required of you to support and provide information to that person. Now, to be certified in the profession of architecture, to be able to join that professional association, one need to, of course, study. And in architecture, is, is, uh, you need to get a master's degree. And then you have to practice for three years with another professional, and then you write professional exams, and only then you can join a professional association and so on. You are continuously monitored by uh, what happened, but how you produce your work. But uh, what is important to remember that insurance, that you must be insured. In other words, uh, if something happened, you cannot walk away from the project, but you have to be not only responsible professionally, but also responsible uh, with regard to monetary implication if you do something, if something happened to your uh, work. And this is again, another uh, important element to remember. Now, um, I uh, think, however, that, and this is something that I try my hardest to do as a professor at McGill. Um, what we do is teach or communicate knowledge to our students. We teach them how to design and we teach them uh, sciences, building science and so on. But I believe that something that is harder to teach and need to be taught, even though there is a specific course called professional practice, is what being professional means. In other words, like how you conduct your professional life. And this is something that I found to my work is extremely important. And in some cases I learned, I have to admit, the hard way. And to be blunt and simple, if someone call upon you, call you, and ask you to design a $50 million school or project or theater or residential building, they expect you to behave professionally. In other words, this is, I found that this is the greatest obligation that I have, that I'm, I'm given that amazing responsibility and, and to make a building uh, with somebody else's money. And the things that are important when it comes to professional conduct is, um, for example, to be on time. You know, I'm telling the students, my students all the time, that you have to be there when you are told. You cannot arrive later and find an excuse. If the concrete rock is about to come and pour concrete and you have to supervise the site, you can all say, oh, I got stuck in traffic and so on. It doesn't work this way. You have to have professional conduct. Another important thing is to tell the truth. In other words, you cannot make up excuses. You have to admit right away because it will, you, it will catch you if you will be caught with it later uh, 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 in, in, your, in the project. Then the issue of what I will call professional conduct that come from how you treat others and how you, for example, dress to a professional meeting which is also, I find very important. And it is external sign that also tell to someone to how professional someone is. You know, coming to Israel, I, I had difficulty uh, wearing a tie. You know, when you see, when you are seeing parliament, the prime minister and, and, and the ministers and all the member of the Knesset, nobody wear a tie. So it's something that goes against code of dressing of Israelis. But I believed I had to learn that this is part of the things that is not code of dress, but it is a professional representation toward the subject and the trust that you were given. Now, uh, with regard to um, 
and also you of course have to be honest when it comes to billing. You cannot make up number. It is something that is, you are very, very important in the process and you have to be honest in this regard too. When it comes to uh, things that uh, comes to either Judaism or moral issue, I believe that uh, what we are facing today, and this is something that I try hard to share with my students. And this is, I believe that the planet, us on earth are facing existential challenge. And as you probably know, uh, two weeks ago, the highest temperature that ever recorded on earth was in the west, in the west coast of North America, uh, probably around and in British Columbia. This is 49, if I'm not degrees, something that we never experienced before. Now, I believe that we all need to be our share, but buildings consume some 30% of all energy used and 40% of all natural resources, which means that as an architect, we face an obligation to design building that do their share to combat those issues. And these are moral obligation. In other words, it is my obligation to come to a client and tell him or her that having an office building that will be covered from all surfaces of eleva an elevation with glass is wrong. In other words, you build a huge greenhouse that will consume tremendous amount of energy throughout the building life. And in the winter, you will have to spend fortune to keep it warm. And again, uh, it is a tremendous heat loss that make us generate and consume tremendous amount of energy uh, today. Another issue when I deal with, uh, 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 with clients, I often tell them, yes, you can buy a carpet, but there are carpets and materials that are made of recycled plastic. Why won't you consider that first? The idea of how we can support the circular economy. Nothing will be thrown away into landfill, but it will find a way, its way back into the system. And this is, I find, moral obligation that sometimes does not, is not written in any legal document or in a code, but you have, or you have to exercise your responsibility uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. Now, uh, with regard to a uh, case study, I, I don't know, I thought about what shall I speak about, but I will try to be brief and tell you about my own personal experience. Um, I, growing up in Israel, my parents who arrived from Europe uh, were very privileged. We lived, we lived, we started our life in Israel in a tent. And later, uh, my parents were very lucky to be given a house, an apartment in a shikun. Our first place of living was 350 square feet. But it was a wonderful place. We really enjoy our company, my parents, me and my sister who lived there and we really shared space. But um, it developed later in life, my liking to the issue of affordable housing. And when I came to McGill and I started to study housing, started to study and I said, I want to deal with affordable housing, people commonly told me, hmm, this is not something nice or attractive. You know, why won't you study or work on the design of theaters and big buildings and so on? And I stuck with affordable housing. Now, uh, and in 1990, 
I design and build with a colleague a house on the campus of McGill University called the Go Home that later uh, was replicated by many thousands of units. And we provided homes to many, many thousands of people. It's again, in my opinion, sort, sort of when I reflect on the, my experience there, I believe that the moral obligation and make sure that every human being uh, will have a proper house and a proper shelter is an obligation, perhaps moral obligation. And I worked on, uh, uh, in, in, and I work also in the developing world. Now, uh, in conclusion, what I would like to suggest that uh, there are many privileges that come with being a professional. You gain respect in society, people are appreciate what you do and so on. But I believe that it also come with the old list of other obligation. And this is uh, what I can sum up in, uh, in the sentence, lifelong responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Avi. Uh, very interesting talk. And um, the interesting halakhic issue that you bring up is the concept of continuous responsibility. You can never walk away from your responsibilities. And uh, that's something that we should probably keep in mind as we move forward. Uh, Moving on, uh, we are privileged to have with us uh, this evening Rabbi Emmanuel White, who is a spiritual leader of the uh, Hevershas congregation. And uh, he also, uh, I believe Sean was probably one of your teachers if you went to Herzliya. And, yes, uh, he was. <laughs> yes. And uh, I hope you're a good student. Anyway, so uh, Rabbi White, uh, has a vast amount of experience uh, dealing with halakhic issues, dealing with community issues, dealing with children, uh, young men, young women, uh, and teaching them to become responsible Jews. Uh, he uh, hails from Boston, so uh, we're landsmen in a certain sense, and uh, he uh, also uh, completed his uh, doctoral studies uh, after studying uh, at Yeshiva University in New York, uh, here at McGill, with his uh, doctorate. So uh, without further ado, uh, there are a number of halakhic issues that have been brought up, not uh, the least of which would be to explain the obligations uh, explained or, or, or brought out in detail in Devarim, which we're reading now, uh, the issue of uh, the laws of Shabbat, uh, which uh, Sean uh, brought up, and uh, the issues of, uh, of collegiality, uh, which Avi brought up, which are extremely important in, in halachic uh, issues as well, in terms of morality. So Rabbi White, mm -hmm. uh, I'd appreciate if you'd uh, add some of your comments uh, okay. to oh. this. And uh, after that, we'll follow up with some questions. So I'll give you uh, okay. uh, about 10 to 15 minutes if you uh, would like. Okay, um, so first of all, I'm sorry that I came late, but I was uh, asked to, um, I was at the Minion at, um, at the Spanish and Rabbi Popko, Rabbi, Rabbi Pinto was, uh, yeah, sorry. Interesting slip. <laughs> <laughs> well, they both begin and end with a P and an O sound. So, um, but I, um, so I, I was asked if I would, um, uh, speak at the um, uh, at the shloshim that we had in the synagogue tonight, and then I will wind up speaking to some other people, and that's why I was uh, very late in coming. Um, I, I did want to just the first comment about. Um, uh, so I came in in the middle of um, Professor Gears' comment, but before I say anything, as you mentioned about uh, uh, Sean. Yes, Sean was. A, I really enjoyed having him. He was a student. I can remember exactly where he sat in class. Really. In, uh, and I think it was in the second row on the left-hand side, and uh, really was a, it was a pleasure having him as a student, he and his uh, sister also. So uh, I'll point that out. You know, there's a pasuk in Sefer Mishle that illustrates what uh, Professor Gear was saying, and also um, 
what the Shaman was saying, that Bechol Derachecha Da'ehu. So in everything, whatever you do, you have to keep Hashem in mind and you have to know Hashem in whatever direction you are going. Um, and just commenting on a, uh, an engineer, I'm always reminded, we talk about what engineers do when they build bridges, and I'm always reminded of the, um, the line that was popularized based on what Rav Nachman of Breslov said, that Ki Ha'olam Kulo Eino Eino Ela Geshet Sam Ahod, that the Velo Lafachit Klal, and there have been some changes in the version over the years, but the world is like um, a Geshet, like a like a bridge, and our job in the world is to cross that bridge, and not to be afraid. We have to do the right thing, and if we do the right thing, we know that we will cross that bridge successfully, and we say, uh, when we come to uh, Olam Haba. You know, uh, imagine that. Um, so in response to uh, what Sean was saying, and uh, these are some really serious questions, um, I might point out that uh, throughout the history of Halakha, there has always been a concern of the rabbis to find heterim. Uh, and by that I don't mean dispensations. I mean that based on Jewish law, to find ways to be able to deal with situations as they came up. Classic example, the great classic example, is Chametz on Pesach. If you read the Torah, and also if you read the Talmud, we take it beyond the Torah, just reading the Talmud, you get the feeling, you get the impression, that it's quite clear. If Pesach comes, and I have Chametz in my house, I must get rid of that, I have to burn it, I have to get rid of that Chametz. But as the years went by, the rabbis realized that um, that could create great hardships for people. And slowly but surely, the rabbis, based on concepts that they had in the Talmud, were able to find leniencies. Um, but you just can't keep the chametz. They can't. You can't ask for just pat permission. Let me have. I'm special. Let me have permission to keep my chametz. It has to be done in a certain way. So we can arrange a contract that you can sell your chametz to a non-Jew, because a non-Jew is allowed to have chametz on Pesach. And technically, you're selling it to him, which means, or her, which means he has to pay for it. But we have ways of getting around that. And uh, again, within the halachic framework, ways of solving that. Another classic question is coming up very soon. You follow the news from Israel. Next year is a Shnat Shemitah. According to Shnat Shemitah, you're not allowed to, to tend your land. If you're a farmer, you're not allowed to take care of your crops. You're not allowed to grow your crops. You're not allowed to even tend to them, tend to them on, on um, the sabbatical year. So again, in modern times, as Jews started to return to the land of Israel, and people realized there would be great hardships if people let their land grow fallow for a year, and that we're not at the time of the Mashiach yet, and we're not ready for this yet. So again, there were heterim, which great Rabbanim have allowed. We know that it became a political issue, and there are those who very vehemently do not accept that heter, but this is called the heter of, again, the Mechirat Chametz. So, let's say, if even before computers were invented, somebody owns a business. Uh, it's a big business. I, I can't close it on Shabbat. If I close it on Shabbat, I'm going to lose uh, a, a lot of income. I, I'll, I'll lose to my competitors. So what am I going to do? If I'm able to close completely on Shabbat, that's that's great, but if it's going to be a great hardship for me, so again, 
we can go to a rabbi. It has to be a rabbi who's knowledgeable in this particular area, not, not everyone is. And you go to a rabbi who's able to deal with this, who's knowledgeable, and they're able to arrange a, a deal whereby you're selling part of the business to a non-Jew. And again, you work out a contract like that so that the business can be operated on Shabbat. Again, if you can avoid that, that's great. That's wonderful. But if you can't avoid it, then um, there are ways of solving the problem. Right? Uh, now, when computers came onto the scene, so as Sean referred to, so what do you do? Can you keep your website open on Shabbat? If it's possible again, certainly, Matov Umanaim, how wonderful it is if you can close the website and just not have it operating at all on Shabbat. My understanding is that a, there's a big electronics operation in Manhattan. My uh, grandson used to work for them for a short period of time. Some of you remember my grandson when he was uh, in Montreal for a few weeks. Now he lives in Israel. He went to Aliyah. Um, um, and as far as I know, they completely, it's, it's called B&H Photo, and they completely closed their website on Shabbat. No business on Shabbat, just like they closed their store on Shabbat, they closed the website. Too bad. If you want to do business, you'll wait till after Shabbat. Huh? Too bad. Okay. Um, however, many businesses feel they just can't do that. They just have to somehow work out an arrangement. And again, uh, there are Rabbanim. Uh, I know that there's a very fine organization in Israel called Eretz Chemda. It's a... Um, uh, a Zionist orientated, but a very religious, very knowledgeable group of post scheme. And uh, they have worked out a, a system that you can arrange your, uh, your business so that no order will be uh, processed uh, on Shabbat, no money will be received on Shabbat. So they have the computer set up so that even if somebody places an order on Shabbat, it doesn't really get placed on Shabbat, it's just stored in the computer, and then after Shabbat the computer will get to work and will set it. So it is possible to do that, and therefore to feel that be keeping the, the, the Shabbat, the spirit of Shabbat, and relating to the modern world. So again, those are the two options. If possible, Thank you, Rabbi, Rabbi White. Thank you very much I'm for, sorry, I'm for those sorry. options. But uh, we're, we want to open it up to okay, some questions as well afterward. Uh, okay. So uh, okay, I'm glad to see that uh, Sean is back in your class. <laughs> yeah. And I hope he paid attention. And yeah. I hope that he uh, will be able to apply some of the solutions which you <laughs> suggested. Okay. So I'm going to open it up uh, to questions. I just ask people uh, to make sure that uh, they actually ask questions uh, and not make uh, extra speeches. We've had enough speeches so far. So Albert Herskovich, you're on. Thank you very much, Jim. And I want to express my amazing satisfaction at the three presentations tonight. They were just beautiful. And I have a couple of questions. One is addressed to Sean Corrine and the other one is addressed to professors uh, Ronnie Gare and Avi Friedman. I don't know which one to start with, but let's start, let's start with uh, Ronnie Gare and uh, Avi Friedman since Ronnie started first and Avi ended the, was the number three presentation. I'd like to refer to that building in Florida that was uh, unfortunately destroyed with the loss of over hundred people and the entire building was demolished. From an ethical point of view, that building was, that building was built on a strip of land, not very wide, very narrow, with a body of water on one side and a body of water on the other side. And as Ronnie mentioned, you know, there's a water seepage. He gave an excellent example on what happened as a result of water seepage. 
And the question is asked whether the, uh, the building was uh, damaged as a result of uh, damaged foundations resulting from uh, water seepage, and actually seawater on top of that. And the question I have is ethically speaking or morally speaking, should the architects and the engineers have built that building in that location in the first place, knowing that such problems might arise in the future and cause such loss of life? And then I'll address my second question to, to Sean, if I'm allowed to. Avi, do you want to take it since you, 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 your name begins with A? So <laughs> A's come to it. Yes, um, it is a, a question and I debated if to put it in my own presentation. First, I can uh, assure, you, assure you that the architect does not sleep at night. They are very worried uh, these days. But as you know, building, and I know that Tony can add more, is the building process of selecting site is highly regulated. There is soil test and so on that make the building uh, uh, that, that tells whether the soil can sustain such a building, such weight. So things are, are studied before the process begin. The second one is that every building need to be approved by regulators. So it's not that you give it to the developer, it goes through uh, a regulator, which is the city of uh, CSERF, and they check the drawings and they have engineer of staff to check that everything is done correctly. And as you know, in Florida, there is tons of water and, and all over the place. So they have certain foundation that they have to uh, 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 comply with. Now, the question is whether once the drawings have been prepared, whether they are, they were correct, they were good, designed to be built on this kind of soil, and whether the developer, the builder, follow them up. When you see collapse of apartment building in the develop, developing world, it does happen because there is usually, they don't fool the right, they don't put the right reinforcement. And then the third issue is, has to do with the trigger. And again, briefly, uh, the question is whether something happened over time that was not under the control and could not foresee by the builder and the architect and the engineer, and this will be considered as force majeure. So there is a lot of inquiry to do now, and maybe Ronnie will add some more if I did not cover this subject well. I think the one thing you could have added to that, Avi, is the issue of collegiality, of being able to work with other people who respect your design, who respect all of the conditions, uh, etc. So yeah. that was something you brought up as well in your talk. Yeah. Uh, yes. Ronnie, would you like to follow up on that? Um, yes. Um, so I'll start by saying that my professional obligation is to say that this is not my area of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the, the only other thing to say is that this, this is obviously a, a major disaster. And as such, there's going to be a commission and there will be professionals or there will be experts that will study this over probably many years and they will they will then come to the conclusions we don't know yet exactly whether there was a structural failure whether there was a foundational failure whether there were changes over time but um, all I can say is that if things are done properly then, then there will be a report just as there was a report for the Walkerton uh, uh, tragedy and um, and and the the blame will be will be clear and if if, if there's a penalty to be paid there will be a penalty a penalty to be paid by a fine or, or you know, imprisonment, whatever is, is the correct thing. But at this stage, you know, it, 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 I don't think we, it's fair for us to, to comment any further. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Uh, Albert, with your permission, uh, you had a second question, but Rose has a question. And given our time constraints, I'm going to let Rose ask her question now, and I'll come back to you afterward. Okay? Rose. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sean, this is a question for you. Uh, in your organization, do you work with cybersecurity companies or is the cybersecurity done in-house? 
Yeah, and that's a great question, Rose. Thank you. We do work with uh, some cybersecurity partners. In fact, we uh, just uh, <laughs> about two weeks ago, we uh, we finished a very detailed and rigorous security audit for our global companies. Um, but we do partner up with different organizations to do some of the stress testing. Um, as well as provide their recommendations. In terms of the actual implementation of any suggestions, we take care of a lot of that in-house, but obviously our expertise in-house is somewhat limited. So we do reach out to the experts. Our focus internally is really to focus on our best practices, which inevitably is our core competency, our, our shipping and logistics space. Um, but yes, there is for sure an element of cybersecurity at play in everything that we build. So although we do some of it in-house, at times we need to reach out to others who have far more experience in that. Fine, that also goes back to the issue of collegiality that we were talking about before. Yes, very much so. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, I'm going to go back to Albert because he had a second question. Uh, Albert? Albert, are you Albert, there? you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. Thanks. Jim. Oh, we thought you got lost on a bridge somewhere. No, I'm here. I'm okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, my second question to Sean is addressed to Sean is. Uh, the following, you made allusion to that evergreen ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal. And you said it was, there were many mistakes made and you blame that on uh, software. Now, I followed that, uh, that incident very closely for the six days that the ship was stuck in the canal. It affected supply lines and supply chains for hundreds if not thousands of companies. The whole world was affected by that. All the world economy, the stock market was affected by that. How do you explain that being a software uh, error, considering that, to my knowledge, it was the pilots, the Egyptian pilots that took over the ship to maneuver it across the canal? So how, how, did, how did software get into the picture here? So first off, it's not necessarily software that caused that failure. Uh, what I did say is that it's very important that when you do have software to really stress test it very thoroughly because it could potentially have disastrous consequences. Um, that being said, I know that ships do have very enhanced safeguards in place to avoid exactly that. Similar to an airplane's autopilot system, which has numerous safeguards in place to ensure that a crash doesn't, God forbid, happen, ships have something similar. Now, that being said, if these Egyptian pilots or these Egyptian captains did in fact come on and actually maneuver the ship into such a position, well, that's very unfortunate. Um, and it's not to say that the ship did have adequate safeguards in place. But one thing's for certain, there will be an assessment done. There will be an investigation done. If it hasn't already started, I believe it has. It has, uh, yes. to it has. And I'm certain that they will come up with some recommendations to implement. And part of that will be software based to ensure that uh, subsequent ships don't and won't be able to maneuver in such a position that they'll find themselves stuck in a canal, whether it be the Suez or the Panama or any other canal. So not necessarily software at the heart of the issue, as I alluded to in my presentation, the software can be the vehicle, but ultimately it's up to the people to drive that vehicle. So. Um, yeah, um, if, if you don't mind, if I'd like to uh, uh, add something to that, Jim, if that's okay. Please. Um, it's this idea of failure. So um, we, we have to live and recognize and learn from failure. Failure, is not such a bad thing if it occurs in your stress test, for instance, in Sean's stress test, or even in a stress test on a on a laboratory scale bridge. Um, of course, failure is a, is a is a problem when it occurs in real life and people are injured or or are killed or, or there's a financial consequence. But whatever the uh, the scale of failure, failure is actually in a in a way a good thing because we learn from these failures, or hopefully we learn from failures. And provided that we learn from failures, 
then that sort of failure will not happen again. You know, we're only human. We cannot think of every, of, of every possibility, of every eventuality. And as a result, failures will occur. Um, and again, going back to, the, to, to, to our time in the desert, 40, 40 years in the desert, many times we failed and we learned the consequences of our failures, um, the punishments or whatever else uh, you know, happened as a result of, of our failures. So th this, this is a, actually, um, it's part of engineering culture, in fact, that we, we, we understand that, that there is a, a, a possibility of failure. Another a word very closely related to failure is the word risk. So nothing is 100% risk-free. So we, as engineers, we have to design for a certain level of risk, which is considered acceptable. Uh, the general public, I think, doesn't really appreciate that fully. Um, but it is, it is a very, very important concept. Thanks. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, thank you, Ronnie, and thank you, Sean. We're uh, almost, we're in fact, we're over time at this point in time, like in a hockey game. Uh, but I think that those reflections uh, bring our series to a very interesting conclusion. Uh, and I'd like to hearken back to our first presentation uh, when we looked at the backdrop uh, to professionalism. And the one thing that I think was extremely important at that point was to realize that all professionals are responsible. Uh, this is not only an issue of professional uh, ethics and professional responsibility, uh, but it's also a, an ethical uh, issue in terms of uh, Jewish ethics, that we are all responsible one for the other, and that we constitute a community where there's shared responsibility. And I think that came through very clearly in what Ronnie said today, what uh, Sean said, and what Avi said as well. That's something that, that uh, is a common denominator. Within the uh, Quebec system, uh, that responsibility is recognized. And uh, that's why all of the professional orders have uh, in place a syndic who can receive complaints from the public if the public feels that they have been aggrieved or if they have not been properly protected. And so uh, the syndic is empowered uh, to conduct investigations like the investigations uh, that will be uh, held after the Florida disaster and so on. And uh, they are allowed also to uh, make certain dispositions after their investigation uh, that can range from compulsory continuous education for the professional to make sure that he or she knows exactly what he's supposed to be doing and can go all the way to the extreme of removing someone from the role of the professional order. And by doing so, uh, the Sandik and the professional order, uh, in fact, through their actions, uh, do in fact protect the public. So if you look at the, the legal framework in Quebec, uh, the sole purpose of the professional orders, whether it be the order of engineers, the order of architects or, or whatever, is to protect the public. And so uh, as uh, practicing professionals, whether you're a Jewish professional, or you're a non-Jewish professional, your responsibility as far as protecting the public is the same. Uh, it so happens, however, that those of us who are members of the Jewish community uh, feel there is an extra layer of responsibility. Uh, and that came through in all of the presentations today and the ones which we have heard over the last few weeks. So I, I'd like to thank all of the presenters for the work that they did in preparing their presentations for today, for their participation. I'd like to thank Rabbi White uh, for providing his uh, expertise from a Lafayette point of view. This is the second time that he's done this. And so I I'd really appreciate that. And also thank the other members of the clergy of the Spanish and Portuguese who took part in our presentations, including uh, Rabbi Pinto 
and uh, Hazan Ben Lolo. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I'm gonna close the session. Thank everyone for your participation and remind you that if you miss something or you'd like to revisit anything that has been said during any of these sessions, they are all available on the Spanish and Portuguese uh, YouTube uh, channel. So thank you very much and I wish you uh, a good evening and hasta <laughs>